We've all heard the term, the calm before the storm, right? Uh, metaphorically, it can refer to that brief period of time between when you finish cleaning the house and when company arrives. You remember the old days back when we used to have company? It can refer to that moment just before your spouse realizes that you didn't change the dishwasher like you said you would. But more literally, if you've ever been outside when weather patterns change and a storm comes in, you may have felt the calm before the storm. Uh, atmospheric pressure drops and the wind changes direction and there is a period of dead calm before the weather puts on a show. As we return to our journey through the book of Revelation, we come to chapter 8 where John writes about the calm before the storm. And it's important to understand a couple of things before we jump back in. The first is this. Understand that no credible scholar will tell you that this vision that John is having is in any way chronological. People try to find all kinds of references to current events around the opening of the seals and the sounding of the trumpets, but there's just no evidence to suggest that what John is seeing is being relayed in any kind of a chronological way, so we should set that thought aside. The other thing to understand is that context, context is everything when you read the Bible, and maybe especially when we read Revelation. We need to remember as we approach chapter 8, we've already seen the revelation of the four living beings, the 24 elders gathered around the throne, the lamb who is worthy to untie the scrolls, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and this metaphorical 144,000 as well. These are vignettes of eternity that will have been understood more clearly by the first readers of the book than they are by us. All we can do is seek to know the will of the Lord and to put it into action. Because we don't fully grasp the cultural context of the first readers of the book, we do well to try to avoid reading our own cultural context into what John wrote for the benefit of a first century audience. Instead, we do well to draw principles from what we learn in the book and then apply those to our world today while we wait for the second coming of Jesus with all due preparation on our part. If we thought the sledding was tough before, hold on tight, because it ain't going to get any easier, I assure you. The first six seals at this point have been broken, and in chapter 8, the Lamb breaks the seventh seal, and you won't believe what happens next. That was the equivalent of homiletical clickbait right there, in case you wondered. Revelation chapter 8. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. For most of us, the only silence we experience it, and that's if we remember to do it, is uh, around 60 seconds on Remembrance Day. Even in church, we don't always make that kind of space for God. We don't simply just sit in silence. Church leaders resist bringing in silence, often because congregations don't really know what to do with it. After just a few seconds, people start rustling or coughing or trying to unwrap one of those candies that has the notoriously loud cellophane. Nowadays, we also resist it because we live in the era of live broadcasting. Hi, Mom and everybody out there. And... When we broadcast our worship gathering, silence is dead air. And dead air is what causes people to change channels. So we resist it. But maybe if the church builds silence into its culture, we might be less likely to resist it. 
Sometimes people have these lists uh, uh, of things they're going to talk about when they get to heaven. They're going to talk to their mom or they're going to talk to God or they're going to talk to Sir Winston Churchill about this, 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 and this. And there might well be time for that to happen. But alongside the continuous praise of God in his holy and living presence, there may also be silence. Just as an aside, let me encourage you in your personal devotional time, whether you do it in the morning or sometime through the day or in the evening, uh, just to include some silence so that the Lord can speak to you, right? Too often we see prayer as a one-way conversation. We have our laundry list that we give to God. But it should also be an opportunity for the Lord to speak to us. And we need the silence to make space for that. Don't think for a moment that it's easy. Because we have become toxified by noise. Whether it's just the TV playing in the background or the clicking of the, uh, of, of the compressor on the refrigerator. Human beings find silence hard, and you know what? The devil likes that. The more Satan can do to keep you from hearing God, the happier he is. So as difficult as silence may seem at the beginning, persevere, knowing that you're ticking off the devil every time you allow for silence in your life. So Revelation 8.1 says that the opening of the seventh seal resulted in a half hour of silence before all of heaven. The calm before the storm. What's next? Verse 2. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and they were given seven trumpets. Now this would have been a familiar concept to any believers with a Jewish background who would have read this initially because the concept of seven archangels was common in Jewish tradition. And the blowing of a trumpet could have any number of meanings. It could be a call to temple worship, it could be a call to war, it could be the coronation of a king, or a call to remembrance, or even the sound of triumph. Of course, in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul says that the second coming of Jesus will be met with the sound of a trumpet. This is why some pipe organ builders developed what's called a trompette en chamade. Uh, and uh, literally, it's a trumpet call. Normally, this reed stop was placed horizontally, uh, out, you know, pointing out from the organ chamber instead of speaking upward the way most organ pipes do. And I will admit to being part of the 5% of the world's population that enjoys organ music. And I'm a sucker for the trompette en chamade. One Sunday, we were on vacation, and we went to a very, very formal church in downtown Montreal. And at the time of the offering, the choir sang an anthem, and when they were finished, the organist, uh, they, they sang it a cappella, and so when they were done, the organist sauntered back to the organ and started improvising on the theme of the anthem, which was lovely. And he was kind of wandering his way back to the key of G. And, uh, of course, they, that's, you know, only, only the doxology is only sung in G, right? That's in the, the Bible somewhere. No, it's not in the Bible. Anyway, uh, he found the key of G for the singing of the doxology, and he was increasing the registration as he went along. And finally, out came the trompette en chamade, and, and, and it introduced the doxology, and that was the only time I melted into a puddle while singing praise God from whom all blessings flow. Like I said, I'm a sucker for it. So that's what I think of when I think of angels blowing trumpets. So these angels were each given a trumpet in the midst of that 30 minutes of silence. You knew something big was going to happen. Here's verse 3. Then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. And a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Now, we are very low church reformed folks in these parts. 
And so we don't know much about incense in church. I mean, we, we don't know much about incense, period, probably, except for the frankincense that came with the gold and the myrrh that were given to Jesus at that first epiphany. But in some very formal churches, incense is used as a part of worship on a regular basis. And that incense burner is called a thurible, T H U R. I-B-L-E. And uh, in those churches, the priest will put the thurible on a chain with the incense in it, and he'll swing it around and sometimes, you know, do the, I don't know if they do the loop-de-loop or not. Maybe that would be disrespectful, I don't know. But anyway, makes all this smell fill the space. And what it does is it enhances the sensory aspect of their worship life. However, in this thurible, that incense was mixed with the prayers of God's people as an offering to the Lord. The angel that did this then did something rather more surprising. Verse 5 says, Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth, and thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. Then the seven angels with their seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty blasts. So the silence has been broken. But before we see what happens next, again, a little context is really helpful. Back in the early days of God's people, if you're familiar with some of the Old Testament stories of God's people of old, you might remember that the people went to Egypt, the, you know, the Israelites went to Egypt to escape a famine, because the Holy Land had a major famine going on, and Egypt wasn't so badly off. So they, they kind of settled there, but after a generation... Uh, The Pharaoh was gone, who remembered God's people, and the new Pharaoh took over, and that Pharaoh decided to enslave all the Israelites. And in fact, the new Pharaoh said whenever a Hebrew baby boy was born, he was supposed to be killed by the order of Pharaoh, but the midwives feared God, and so they didn't tell Pharaoh when baby boys were born, and one of those baby boys was Moses. And God charged him with the task of leading his people out of Egypt and back into the promised land. And this would take some doing, of course, because the Hebrew slaves were useful to the Egyptians, and so they didn't want to let them go. So in aid of their freedom, God sent down plagues on the Egyptians that would wreak havoc on them, but would not affect the Israelites. So there was the plague of blood that turned the Nile River to blood. There was the the plague of frogs, the plague of gnats, the plague of flies. There's 10 of them, by the way. The the plague of of lives against the livestock, killing them off. Plague of festering boils, plague of hail, of locusts, and of darkness. And amid all this, God's chosen people were kept completely safe from these plagues. Eventually, uh, after all this, Pharaoh said, okay, you can leave. But he chased them anyway, and that's where the parting of the Red Sea story comes in, if, if you've read that. Um, really, take some time this afternoon uh, and just read the last 20 chapters of Genesis and the first 20 chapters of Exodus. It's a really compelling story. <laughs> Now, with that bit of context, you may appreciate what happens when the angels blow their trumpets in Revelation 8. This is verse 7. The first angel blew his trumpet, and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. One third of the earth was set on fire, one third of the trees were burned, and all the green grass was burned. Now, some people go looking for some contemporary image hiding behind every rock in the book of Revelation. And those who do that interpret this verse to refer to atomic fallout. But I think if that were really the case, you might want to say, say, why did God choose to wait till the middle of the 20th century to exact this punishment on his world? What about those 60 earlier generations? 
I think it's best to see this as environmental judgment. The, the burned trees would bring a fruit shortage, and the burned grass would cause a famine among the animals. You see a parallel with the uh, plagues against Egypt? It suggests that perhaps even in the midst of this global disaster that God's people would be safe. So the first trumpet brings environmental judgment on the earth. Verse 8, Then the second angel blew his trumpet, and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One third of the water in the sea became blood, one third of all things living in the sea died, and one third of all the ships on the sea were destroyed. A great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea, and this is long before CGI and special effects, right? One third of the water in the sea became blood. Another parallel? So here we have a commercial judgment. All goods moved by sea, and if a third of the ships were destroyed, that would be a huge hit. But why just one third? Why not the whole enchilada? There doesn't seem to be a definitive answer for this. But we can consider that one third is a significant minority. So maybe this was just a a shot across the bow, if you will. A, A warning to the world of impending judgment to tell people what's coming if they don't repent. So that may help us as angel number three blows his trumpet. This is verse 10. Then the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch. It fell on one-third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star was Bitterness. It made one-third of the water bitter, and many people died from drinking the bitter water. So here we have a judgment against the natural resources, and yet another parallel with the plagues of Egypt. You think Nestle... Uh, owning so many rights to water is bad? Try bitterness. Seeking to preserve the environment is good. But having the right reasons for doing so is also good. Do we preserve the world because it's all we've got? Or do we preserve the environment because, as the psalmist says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it? People in that culture, as in ours, were terrified by forces of nature. And a star falling from the sky that poisoned water would be too much for a lot of them. Again, just a third, a partial judgment. This is verse 12. Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and one-third of the sun was struck, and one-third of the moon, and one-third of the stars, and they became dark. And one-third of the day was dark, also one-third of the night. Again, forces of nature just terrified people. Even pagans feared darkness as a form of judgment. And then to top it off, verse 13. Then I looked, and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air, Terror! Terror! Terror to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. The birds often carried special messages, but this one spoke. We marvel at the size and majesty of the eagle, especially in parts of the country like ours where we don't see them all that often. But to behold one crying, terror, terror, terror. That would send most people running for cover, wouldn't it? Uh, The word translated terror in verse 13 is the word that is commonly translated woe. Think of Jesus' denouncement of the towns of Galilee in Matthew 11, where people had heard the good news and seen miracles performed before them, but they had not repented. Jesus pronounced woe to Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum, saying, even Sodom will be better off on judgment day than you. Yikes. Now, I don't know much about ornithology, but this eagle in the sky was a bit like a canary in the coal mine, wasn't he? It's a harbinger, something foreshadowing a future event, and in this case, the future event is a more complete judgment than is revealed by the opening of the seventh seal. But there is some good news in here, too, among these parallels with the plagues of Egypt. After the people had been rescued from the Egyptians, as they were wandering in the desert, 
on their return to the promised land, God is about to give Moses the Ten Commandments, and he tells Moses to remind his people of something. The people have been complaining and pining to go back to Egypt where they had three square meals a day, forgetting that they had been enslaved. And in Exodus 19, verse 4, God tells Moses to remind the Israelites that he rescued his people on eagles' wings. So there is hope. Even with the terrifying view of a single eagle shouting terror to the people who belong to the world when these last three angels blow their trumpets. In one sense, then, even these visions of judgment, which are partial, are part of the calm before the storm. All right. What does this puzzling and somewhat terrifying passage tell us that can actually be helpful for us faithful people today? Well, one simple thing is that we should not be afraid of silence. In fact, we should revel in it every chance we get. When we make space for silence, we make space for God. This is true of our personal lives, in our worship life, even in our working life. Sometimes a little silence can help us clear the air and move forward. As followers of Jesus, silence gives us the opportunity to listen for that still, small voice of God to speak into our lives, preparing us for what's next. Another thing this strange passage teaches us is that the Lord's work in the past assures us of his work in the future. As these four trumpet-blasting angels have revealed to us in the judgment of God, so the next three will do likewise. Pay attention to God's work in your life. Sometimes we wonder how on earth we can do that. One good way is to journal, just to keep a log of your prayers and thoughts as you intentionally look for God's fingerprints over even the most menial details of your life. And if you find that difficult, consider the concept of meeting with a spiritual director, something that I've said little about over the past few years. So for those of you who might be newer here, a spiritual director is someone who is trained to journey with you and help you notice the work of God in your life. You sit with that person for about an hour, once every month or so, and you share your life with the director who listens carefully and asks probing questions and helps you to make room for silence and make room for God, basically to go deeper in your walk with him. And if you're thinking, boy, I wonder where I might find a spiritual director. I uh, have been practicing for 11 years now, so I'm getting not half bad at it. Feel free to talk to me and we can arrange to chat. So don't be afraid of silence. Be aware of God's past work uh, that assures us of his future work. And third, remember that God is sovereign over the natural elements and sometimes uses them to judge throughout history. The insurance company gets this, right? You read the fine print on any insurance policy you have, and what are you going to see in there? Something that says, Acts of God. In reference to otherwise inexplicable natural disasters. What seems random is actually the sovereign hand of God, and sometimes that's hard to take, especially when it leads to the loss of life. But we have to trust the Lord who knows all things, that he can and will work through even what appears to us to be an unspeakable tragedy. People could live with the assurance of God's sovereign care, but more often than not, they choose to live in fear instead. Think back to December the 31st, 1999. There were people who were squirreling away canned goods, drawing bathtubs full of water, taking all their money out of the bank, because as soon as the calendar on all those computers changed to zero, everything was going to be gone. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't. People were afraid of what Y2K was going to do. In fact, 
that right around that time I preached a sermon series called how to be why to okay and turns out we were and I but I can tell you that in this age of COVID-19 not much has changed people still prefer fear to trusting God one more thing we can learn God seeks people's attention through judgment In one sense, those first four trumpet sounds were a warning to the unbelieving world. What might God be doing in judgment in our time that could serve as a warning and a call to repentance and faith? I mean, there's one really obvious thing, but you may think of some others as well. And just as the prayers of God's people were offered up with incense in that thurible in John's vision, so our prayers can make a difference as we seek to encourage people toward repentance and faith. Eugene Peterson uh, was a Bible translator, a pastor, a theologian. He said this, While conflicts raged between good and evil, prayers went up from devout bands of first century Christians all over the Roman Empire. Massive engines of persecution and scorn were ranged against them. They had neither weapons nor votes. They had little money and no prestige. But they had prayer. And so do you and I. Their prayers and our prayers have the power to shape human history. Judgment comes in response to prayer. So we can't be silent about the impending judgment. When that happens, we'll soon be silent on the wrath of God. We'll be silent on the cross. Of course, talking about the judgment of God is not exactly the best tool of evangelism, is it? But if you let your knowledge of the impending judgment fuel the encouragement you have to share your faith in winsome ways, then it's all for the good. Despite the last two years and what they've brought us, despite the wars our world faces today, despite all manner of challenging circumstances that exist, perhaps now we are in the calm before the storm. And that means now is the time for our own repentance and faith and for calling others to repentance and faith. Because as much as we don't like it, even as those who will be preserved judgment is coming and we want people to be ready even as we ourselves are ready so we can go and sow some seeds of faith who knows how those may be watered and how they may grow let's pray father we thank you for your word even though it puzzles us and troubles us from time to time And while we struggle to appreciate your sovereign hand at work when it results in tragedy, we pray that you will draw more people to yourself so that the impending judgment will not affect them. Give us words to call those we love to repentance so that the life of faith will be theirs and the safe passage you gave to your people of old will also be the safe passage you grant to your faithful people today. We pray for the softening of many hearts, for the repentance of many souls, so that Jesus will get the praise and the honor and the glory. Amen. Now, if today's message prompted you to say yes to Jesus, I'd love to hear from you so that I can offer you some encouragement and some tools that will help you live for him. So speak to me over coffee if you're here, or if you're online, hit me up on the connection card, stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect, and I will be glad to continue to be in touch. I invite you to stand as we sing.